So good afternoon and thank you for coming. My name is Gail O'Sullivan. I work with APT Associates based in the United States and I lead our behavior change communication and social marketing work in the International Health Division. I'm delighted to have a great panel here with me today to talk to you about the recent Ebola crisis. Uh, we are going to have some opening remarks, then we will have our two live presenters. We have a third presenter who could not be with us here today. She's in the US, but she's recorded her presentation by video, so we'll play that. And then we hope to have uh, quite a bit of time still left for questions and answers. So the slideshow that you see behind me, I just learned about today. My daughter put this up on Facebook because the New York Times photographer Daniel Barillac, who took these photos, just won the Pulitzer Prize for photography for his coverage of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. A uh, little over a year ago, one of the worst infectious disease outbreaks in recent times began. Today, about 25,000 people have been infected with Ebola virus disease. 10,000 have died, and 15,000 survivors are trying to re rebuild their lives and manage the many still to be understood long-term side effects of this disease. We're going to focus today on the three most affected countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, with some discussion of the Nigeria and the US experience as well. There are so many aspects of this crisis that we could talk about, but we're going to focus today on applying social marketing principles to help understand what worked what didn't, and to discuss how the theories and tools that social marketing offers might inform a more effective response going forward. This is an excellent example of an issue that would have benefited from better systems thinking, going back to the discussion that we had yesterday morning. In a way, this outbreak was the result of a perfect storm of risk factors. Guinea is a desperately poor country and both Liberia and Sierra Leone are not only poor, but had just recently emerged from protracted civil wars. Before the outbreak, Liberia had fewer than 250 doctors for four million people. Local health systems were very weak. Health workers didn't have proper training. They didn't have proper equipment. Electrical power was in short supply. Much of the local population was illiterate, and there were entrenched cultural and social norms that were very difficult to change. And perhaps most importantly, that fifth P we heard so much about yesterday, politics, led to far more illness and death than there should have been. So Rick, if we could cue up the other slide. Great. And go ahead to the next. So a lot of messaging was going on in the early days that didn't quite hit the mark, and this is just one example of a poster that was well-intentioned, but probably not terribly effective. You don't need to be able to read the small print in these boxes to, to understand just at a glance that 12 messages is probably a little bit too many for one piece of communication. You've got all these do's and don'ts and protect yourself, protect your family, protect your community. And my favorite is the red box at the bottom, which says, do not eat plums eaten by bats. Good to know. I guess I can do this. Next, I'd like to play for you a short clip from CNN about a, a terrible incident that happened in Guinea where eight people were murdered just because of misinformation and mistrust. So Rick, can we cue that up? Healthcare workers trying to combat the Ebola outbreak are facing not only the virus but often public hostility. Eight Guineans from a delegation of health government and religious officials were massacred in the southern town of Womi after the group tried to hide from stone throwing villages. CNN's Nema Albiga recently visited the region to report on the Ebola outbreak and she joins us now from London. Nema, you have a real understanding, boots on the ground understanding of the fear and the mistrust. Uh, by local people towards this disease. Absolutely, Robin. That is often one of the biggest barriers because the tragedy with Ebola is, is that 
if caught early enough and if you are taken to, to a facility that has the resources, then you can survive. It's the dehydration, it's the massive loss of fluids that generally kills victims. But of course the fear is that you could go suspecting that you might have Ebola and be put into some oversubscribed, under-resourced uh, facility locked away with others who definitely have the disease and catch it. And that's what's causing so many people to, to stay away and to attack those like those eight uh, health workers who were killed in this attack in, in Guinea because they're so scared that even if I don't have it, what happens if I go and I catch it there? And, and you talked about that 2,600 number that the World Health Organization has said. The fear is that that really is only the tip of the iceberg, Robin, and, and that is what it is at the center of, of teams like those going out into the rural areas in Guinea and the lockdown in Sierra Leone with volunteers going house to house trying to see if there are any suspected Ebola cases there because until we get a sense of what the true depth of this problem is, it's very difficult to combat it, Robin. I think what's so I think tragic and sad about uh, this group of educators being macheted to death is this, again, this, the, the sense that educators and health workers are on the front line of this. Often it's healthcare workers that are dying of the virus and again, this tempt attempts by local people to go and explain to villages out in rural areas what you're saying. And again, they are the targets. What more can be done? How, how do you get over this? I think what's really interesting to me is, what, you know, we've spoken about the paranoia inside West Africa, but the paranoia is all around us. It is across the world. And it's what's slowing the response to this disease. And until people can, can take that prism, that we're looking at West Africa with and turn it on themselves, the response will be inadequate. We've, it's, it's five months since this outbreak began and only yesterday did the UN Security Council hold a meeting to discuss a coordinated international response and still we haven't yet seen what the plans for that are because realistically a lot of aid workers that are going to be called out by the UN to go in, they are they're looking at what's going on out there and they are afraid, Robin. And, it is that barrier of fear that everybody needs to overcome because it's not going to be limited to West Africa. There are already concerns about cases in the Congo. There are concerns about those traveling back from West Africa. Until people realize that it is a fight that everybody has to be involved in, this is not going to stop. So this um, tragedy reminded me of an interview I heard recently on BBC. Um, they were talking to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who's the president of Liberia, and she was reflecting on the lessons learned from the crisis and said, you know, you have to engage local communities. People distrust outsiders and their solutions. You have to involve the public, you have to be honest, and you have to build trust by working together to devise local solutions. Oops, sorry. So I'm assuming most of you know who the comedian John Stewart is in the United States. Um, he had kind of a field day with Ebola, not to make light of the crisis, but to make light of the media hysteria that ended up surrounding this whole um, outbreak. Um, I'm not sure what the media coverage was like here in Australia, but I can tell you that in the United States, it was pretty insane. For several months, you couldn't turn on your TV or radio or get onto social media without hearing some sort of hysteria about Ebola, the risk factors, how it's transmitted, et cetera, et cetera. It just you know, added another dimension of the problems that we had to deal with in addition to the actual public health emergency. So now we're going to turn to our experts who are going to help us break down what worked and what didn't work, learn some key lessons that we can apply going forward, and really examine this whole situation from a social marketing perspective. First up is Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner. Dr. McGregor Skinner is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at Penn State Hershey Medical Center and teaches three graduate courses on health preparedness for disasters and terrorist emergencies. He is an adjunct professor at Harvard Medical School and teaches graduate students in the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center Fellowship Program. Dr. McGregor Skinner was invited by and funded by the Nigerian government to lead a team from the Elizabeth R. Griffin Foundation to conduct seminars and training workshops and establish hospital Ebola isolation suites. 
At the invitation of U.S. State Departments of Health, he has conducted on-site bio-risk management assessments for Ebola and seminars and workshops at hospitals in the states of California, Georgia, Florida, Pennsylvania, Alabama, and Tennessee. He had three trips to West Africa for U.S. government agencies and U.N. agencies to treat Ebola patients and implement whole community approaches in Liberia also in Nigeria, and then at Emory University in um, the hospital in Atlanta. He has provided expert opinions on Ebola in TV interviews on CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, C-SPAN, Canada, CTV, and Australia ABC. Dr. McGregor Skinner has degrees in veterinary medicine and surgery from the University of Queensland, Australia, a Master of Science in Emerging Infectious and Zoonotic Diseases from the University of London, England, and a Master of Public Health in Epidemiology and International Health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is also a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in England. His passion is engaging networks of experts who share knowledge and experiences to increase the global understanding of risk and preparedness. Gavin? Thank you, Gail. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so one of the things that I was asked to do and what I took my team to West Africa to do was to build the equivalent of behavioral and community immunity to a highly infectious disease like Ebola. So Ebola, this, this current outbreak in 2014 was the largest Ebola outbreak, outbreak that we've had in history. As Gail mentioned, 25,000 known cases, probably many more. This is what a burial team looks like. They're wearing what colour personal protective equipment? It's white. What does white mean in some, of the, in some of the cultures around the world? It means death. So we all went to West Africa thinking that in our hearts we were doing the right thing, wearing white PP, and what were we? We're the stormtroopers. We're the bad guys. We're wearing white. How do we build capacity, though, for people that, haven't, that, that didn't get paid over a six-month period to collect bodies and dispose of them appropriately so we decrease the viral load and decrease the risk. The US Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization calls this just-in-time training. I don't do just-in-time training. I build capacity, I build resilience within communities to ensure that we can respond to any situation. Hold up your thumb for a second. Okay, if a HIV AIDS patient dies, from AIDS, and we put a drop of blood on your thumb, you have about 100,000 partic virus particles. If an Ebola patient dies, and we put a drop of blood on your thumb, you have 10 million virus particles on your thumb. Infectious dose of Ebola? One. So we're dealing with someone who's died from Ebola, Ebola liquefies the body, and they are full of infectious disease agents. We made this mistake over and over again. White personal protective equipment. Someone at WHO said, you need to get the yellow stuff. How hard is it to get yellow PPE? Really hard. And so suddenly there's a huge demand globally for yellow personal protective equipment. What's happening in the Middle East? We have MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a coronavirus, 134 people just died in February. They want personal protective equipment. We had an outbreak of disease in Indonesia and Vietnam. They wanted personal protective equipment. We had a world stock out of personal protective equipment. What did the local people do? They made their own. Did we tell them how to do that? No. They took these patterns and virtually just copied and re-engineered and made their own personal protective equipment. What does an Ebola treatment unit look like? Well, this is one of the ones that I worked at uh, in Sierra Leone, Moyamba Ebola Diagnostic Lab. What color is it? White. It's white. It's death. This is, a, this is the hospital here for 200 patients. How many staff do we need? It's a three to one ratio with a highly infectious disease. 600 staff to, to look after 200 patients. What did we do when, when we were full? Everyone else that came in with symptoms, we turned away. We had run out of space. Here's our, lab, our laboratory diagnostic unit here. As Gail said, we had in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone one doctor 
per population of 55,000. What do we have here in Australia? What do we have in the US? About one to 300 ratio. We had one to 55,000. How much money have we spent on Ebola, the international community? $4.2 billion. One of the great things I do, I live in Washington DC and I do a lot of work for the US government, so we talk a lot about billions of dollars. I don't know what a billion dollar looks like, but I do talk about it a lot. We spent $4.2 billion. In 2012, the World Bank did a study in those three countries and said, for $1.5 billion, we would train all the doctors and nurses they need and build all the hospitals they need. And look what we did. We went in and we built structures that aren't sustainable, are being pulled down right now because we've decreased the number of cases and we haven't built a health system. We haven't contributed anything of sustainability. And we spent $4.2 billion. I want to show you this. All the information I'm going to show you today is freely available from the World Health Organization website. And as my two kids, my 11-year-old and my 12-year-old would say, if I'm looking for something, Dad, just Google it. So if you go on to Google and you look up Ebola preparedness, you'll see the same graph that I've showed you dated the 20th of April. This is 14 countries. Another part of the work that we did with my team from the Elizabeth R. Griffith Foundation, we used the WHO Ebola virus disease checklist to, to determine the readiness of all these countries. Green shows they're ready. Red shows they're not ready. Yellow shows it's in progress. But in the yellow, see these numbers here, 0%, 0%. That means they've thought about it, but they haven't really started as of the 20th of April. So we know that all these other countries are not prepared when it comes to dealing with a highly infectious disease like Ebola. Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia were unlucky. The contiguous countries, we have no idea what happened in those countries because we don't have the diagnostic capability. This is the Ebola response team that I took to Nigeria in September. This is Dr. Parker. Dr. Parker had a plan. Dr. Parker had a whole of community plan that he had leveraged years of experience from working in polio, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB programs, and he had designed for the Nigerian government a plan. Dr. Parker came to Atlanta in August to see the US Centers for Disease Control and the Emory University Hospital. The US Center for Disease Control called me and said, we have a delegation from Nigeria who is looking at their capabilities here, trying to replicate what we have in Nigeria. I went down and met Dr. Parker, and I said, what do you think? He goes, we can't do this. We can't do what CDC has done. We definitely can't do what Emory University has done. It took Emory University Hospital 12 years to set up their Ebola isolation suite. I said to Dr. Parker, this is how much it's gonna cost. If you can pay me the money, I'll get my team there and we'll start helping you. Never th thought I'd never hear from Dr. Parker again. My foundation, the Elizabeth R. Griffin Foundation, is a small family foundation. We have our bank account in Kingsport, Tennessee, another small part of Tennessee. I get a phone call from the bank manager, we're under attack. We've just received $300,000 from the Nigerian government. It's a scam, they're gonna steal all our millions. What are we gonna do? We called the CIA, we called the FBI, we called the government. Dr. Parker called me and said, did you get the money? <laughs> uh, yeah, we did, didn't expect it to come. Can you be here tomorrow? No, but I can be there on Friday. And so we took our team out to help Dr. Parker. When we got to Nigeria, there was so much emphasis on the world, from the World Health Organization and the US CDC on what? This the personal protective equipment. It's not about the personal protective equipment. It's about management, it's about supervision. In the training that I do, I, we, we, we teach people the 10 feet rule. So if I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you and we're 10 feet away, I'm not gonna get Ebola. I teach doctors and nurses and community health workers, don't raise your arms above your shoulders. It takes a lot working with adults to get that done. I teach them not to scratch their face. We teach them the buddy system. The buddy system has been used in the nuclear industry, the chemical industry, the audio, so many different industries, hazmat for years, but in the health industry, it's new. Because we don't work in pairs. We don't work as buddies. And so it's not about this. The other challenge we had is what do I wear under my personal protective equipment? 
nothing. So if you come to the field with me, you're going to see a lot more than you bargain for. <laughs> but the point is, when I'm dealing with nurses, the majority of female, what are they going to wear under their personal protective equipment? Disposable underwear. Did we have disposable underwear? No. Could we get it? No. So we went down to the local market and we said, it's got to look like this. And within 24 hours, we had developed a brand new industry where people in the market, were, and we could pay them, were starting to make disposable underwear. Because you've got to look after your team. So it wasn't about just how to put on this and how to take it off. It was all the other management supervision and personal issues that we had to deal with, as well as the disposable underwear. This is Fatu Kukula. You might have heard of, uh, of Fatu. What we found and what we saw on the ground in Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia were islands of excellence. Fantastic individuals, all small communities, using their own local innovations to protect themselves. I developed my own protective gear. I brought, back, I brought black plastic bags and plastic jackets. 22 family members lived in her house. 14 of them died from Ebola. Fatu Kukula never got Ebola. She went back to infection control first principles, plastic bags on the hands, plastic bags. There was many, many examples like Fatu. How do we develop horizontal information management systems or horizontal communication systems to take this life-saving innovation, local innovation, and replicate it? How do we promote a culture of imitation? And so often we're criticized when we say we need a culture of imitation. If someone does something better, we scale it, we share it, we share the idea, and we get everyone to copy it. But doing the work we do internationally, when we talk about culture of imitation, sometimes we're criticized. But this was an example where we had to promote it. And we, didn't, we couldn't do it. And we weren't that successful in doing it. Ebola patients. Well, I don't know whether you know much about Ebola, but one of the first clinical symptoms of Ebola is a fever, a high fever. Backaches, stomach aches, pains, diarrhea, vomiting. If you're in Africa and you get a fever, what do you have? Malaria! Everyone has malaria in Africa. The very first patient in, in a 44-year-old gentleman, 1976, was misdiagnosed with malaria because they thought it was an unusual malaria outbreak on the banks of the river Ebola, and it turned out to be this brand new disease, Ebola. We stopped using malaria rapid diagnostic kits under the orders of the World Health Organization. The distribution of malaria rapid diagnostic kits is a business in itself. People make money. People, it is a, it, it's a whole logistics chain. It's a way of promoting um, uh, uh, safe behaviours, of, of appropriate behaviours to control the malaria. We were told on the ground, stop doing that. One of the challenges we had though, and this is what we still have in, in our whole universal healthcare system, is that you can have malaria as well as having Ebola. And I was called to a hospital in Washington DC where a, a person had just come back from uh, West Africa and they thought that, per, that, that this patient had Ebola, so we took a sample. We sent it to the National Institutes of Health Lab in Bethesda, and we're waiting for the results to come back. I get a phone call from the DC Health Commissioner. We're going to release the patient, but the results aren't back from the lab. It's okay, the patient's got malaria. The thought processes through physicians, doctors, nurses, that you could have two infections or three infections at some time, never happened. We found out that people had TB, HIV, malaria, and other illnesses, as well as Ebola. If you're on HIV antiretrovirals and you come into Ebola hospital, what happens? We take them away from you. You're on, you're drug, resist, you're on drug resistant TB or TB drugs and you come into Ebola treatment, we take them away from you. If Ebola's not gonna kill you, the TB will. And so we weren't able to adjust to this dynamic situation and work out how to manage patients that had more than one disease, and it happens all the time. Ebola's really easy to kill. It doesn't live very long outside the body, so we, we promoted soap and water. Who, who's ever been involved in a hand washing campaign? Aren't they fun? Sit there with school kids, wash your hands, sing the birthday song, off you go. We do that all the time. 
The other message we gave people was Ebola survives in wet environments. Who washed their hands this morning? What was the soap like when you finished? It was wet. We had millions of cakes of soap from Levi, Eli Lilly, Procter & Gamble, all these companies in their, in their, in their social, in their, um, uh, in their programs uh, to promote, pr promote themselves and everything else, donated bars and bars of soap. In Liberia, we woke up one morning and said, Gavin, we're not using those cakes of soap anymore because they're wet and they have Ebola. And we couldn't change. We, no matter what we tried with messages, we couldn't change that. So we went to bleach. WHO and CDC were saying, you must use 0.05% bleach on yourself and 0.5% bleach on hospital equipment, otherwise it's corrosive. What sort of bleach do we get from the supermarket here in Australia? 3%? Back in Washington DC where I live, you go to the supermarket, you get 8.25%, you get 5% bleach, you get 3% bleach. How do you dilute 8.25% to 0.05% in West Africa? I haven't got a clue. I've got two sixth graders and I can't do it. And we didn't do that. So what happened was that people would say, well, we're not using soap anymore. We're using bleach. And Gavin, you don't smell strong enough. Therefore, we better spray you a bit more. My skin peeled and peeled and peeled. We corroded a material because everyone relied on smell as a form of protection. Ebola decimated social structure. What does this gentleman here have? I haven't got a clue. But we're in the middle of an Ebola outbreak, the world's largest Ebola outbreak, so everyone's going to assume he's got Ebola. He might have malaria. He might have drunk too much last night. He might have TB. He might have something else. No one would touch him. And we had to ensure that we had the logistics and the teams that we go out and pick these people up. What did the three presidents of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone announce in the second week of September? Our countries are close to critical failure and social collapse. What did the rest of the world do? We sent more doctors, we sent more nurses. I had three medical anthropologists on my team. I couldn't get them into country. I couldn't get the WHO to pay for them to go. I couldn't get them there. I had economists, I had GIS specialists. I couldn't get them there. They wanted doctors and nurses. The three presidents of the country going, we are close. We had so much civil unrest, as Gail talked about, and we were so close to social collapse and we didn't respond. We didn't go reach out to help them. Okay, the, the Nigerian hospital, we set up the Ebola isolation suite. This is the laundry on a good day. Ebola patients, constant diarrhea, more diarrhea than you can ever dream of. It is 24 seven diarrhea and it smells terrible. We are constantly cleaning up. As Gail showed that photo, they constantly groan. All of us were, 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 were affected. We had nightmares about from after seeing so many Ebola patients. In all the hospitals I went to, both in the US and in, in West Africa, how many of the laundry ladies or the people who did the laundry were involved in part of the planning or the implementation? None of them. People who prepared the meals or cleaned or washed up the dishes and the utensils, none of them. We look over here, two spouses of Sawyer's primary contacts test test positive for Ebola. For me, this is the first cases that we had in Nigeria of sexually transmitted Ebola. We know Patrick Sawyer, and one of the things that I was sent with my team to Nigeria, I was called into the US Embassy because we thought when Patrick Sawyer flew from Liberia, it was an act of bioterrorism. We thought that Patrick Sawyer was a bioterrorist. He had engineered and arranged to meet significant people at the airport, diplomats, politicians that all subsequently got Ebola and died. And some of those diplomats and politicians went home and saw their wives for the first time in months, had sex with them that night, and their wives then got Ebola. We've known about sexually transmitted Ebola for years, but we've never taken a HIV AIDS counseling approach using condoms. We've never done that in any outbreak. The other point is, is that not only were we talking bioterrorism, but one of the diplomats that Patrick Sawyer met at Abuja Airport came down to Port Harcourt, went to the Marriott Hotel, and rented out the whole floor of the Marriott Hotel and turned it into his own private hospital ward. When I interviewed the staff at the Marriott Hotel, they went, oh, we didn't know that. We had no idea that was going on. He died in that hotel. 
So suddenly we now have the hotel that's contaminated with a high viral load. And, how do, and once that message gets out, who's going to stay there six months later? They're really suffering from a business perspective. Our first patient came on a Wednesday. At 10 a.m. we got the phone call. The nurses I trained, what's the thing we did? I took a photo. That was the last photo I would ever take of them because we're going to work. And we went and had a cup of tea. One o'clock, our first patient arrived. We followed all our checklists. We got the patient into the ward. I came out and said to Dr. Parker, where's the ambulance? Who's decontaminating the ambulance? Dr. Parker picks up his checklist. Oh, Gavin, it's not on my list. Well, it's got to be done. So we put on our gear, and it took us three hours to scrub out this ambulance, which was full of diarrhea and full of Ebola virus. On the Thursday, we got our second Ebola patient. And I said, right, guys, let's put your personal protective equipment on. Let's go scrub out the ambulance. No, we're not doing that. They had used Velcro and, and a big sheet of plastic to create a swimming pool in the back of the ambulance. They dragged out the piece of plastic and said, look, the ambulance is clean. I went, I didn't tell you to do that. Who told you? It was their own local innovation to a very complex solution. And they said, I'm not doing what Gavin told us on the Wednesday. And they had developed a system that we should have said, wow, this is fantastic. Let's ensure everyone else in the other three countries get to learn that system. Stick a bit of Velcro around the top of the ambulance and put in a plastic, piece of plastic. And so you can't underestimate the local solutions you get to, to, to some of these complex problems we deal with. On the Wednesday night, we got attacked. Third, one Ebola patient in our hospital, and we were attacked. The newspaper said anywhere between 1,500 to 3,000. I have no idea, because where was I when, I when we were in the hospital and we got attacked? I put my personal protective equipment on, and I'm going to go in and sit with the Ebola patient. If you want to come and attack me, you're going to get Ebola just as much as I am. And we sat with the Ebola patient. This is the community hospital. Did they break anything? No. Did they hurt us? No. But they spray painted, no Ebola sent all over the place. The next day on the Thursday, we met with the whole community. What was the mistake we made? We didn't engage the community. What was the solution? Well, suddenly they're saying, we need a million dollars of compensation. We need this. How about we take two community members and we put them on the executive board of the hospital and you'll come to every meeting we have. And they went, really? And that's how we solved the problem. We didn't engage the community because we were so much focused on getting the Ebola, training, Ebola isolation suite up and running. When I say that the Nigerian government had a whole community plan, they used social media, they used horizontal information systems, they used web 3.0 technology, they used connectivity, they created the 0800 Ebola number, websites, email, Twitter, Facebook, mobile phones. What's the one thing we didn't do in the US when we had our Ebola patients? We didn't have the 1-800 Ebola help number. Again, as my kids would say, just Google it, Dad. If you go to Google and you put a poison emergency number, what comes up here in, in Australia? 131126. It's manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. What happens if you do it in the US? 1-800-222-1222, the poison emergency number. What did Canada do? They said, hey, we've got a poison emergency number. Let's use those same resources and add a little bit more work to them and make that our 1-800 Ebola help number. What did the UK do? What did Germany do? They did all the same thing. The Nigerians had university students managing their 0800 number. In 2007, I was working on H5N1 or bird flu. We had the same problem in hospitals and on farms. DuPont and Dow had provided the disinfectant, but no one knew how to make up the right concentration. So I went back to DuPont and Dow and I said, look, we're using your product. It's not my product, it's your product. We're using Nokia phones, using Python language. I want you guys to come up with a calculator that will help us, based on any size container, mix the right amount of disinfectant at the right concentration so we don't start hurting people, killing people. It took DuPont and Dow four hours to develop this program. We pushed it out to 27,000 phones. We didn't have any problems like we saw in Egypt or Vietnam or Thailand where we did see people get, suffer from toxic doses of, of, of infectants. It worked. Did we do this for Ebola? No. Did I take this model to the White House and the State Department and the US government in DC? Yeah. Were they ready for it? No. Seven years ago, we were doing this. Here, again, in, you know, 
a country like Indonesia, resilience is key. Earthquakes, tsunamis, boiling mud, volcanoes, you name it. They use motorbikes, government staff, male, female for protection, go out with job aids. They mobilize the community. They do connectivity. We're sitting in West Africa. We need motorbikes. Did we get them? No. Bangladesh, 2008, Category 4 hurricane hits the country. 384,000 people die. The, next, the following year, the government builds shelters for 2 million people. The next Category 4, is category four hurricanes coming down in 2008. We have a big gap to fill. How do, we move, how do we evacuate 2 million people into these hurricane shelters? You get 40,000 university students with 40,000 megaphones and 40,000 bikes and we mobilized and evacuated 2.1 million people in three days. How many megaphones did we take to West Africa? None. How many bikes? None. And we're trying to engage the community. We're trying to get them on, to give them messages that they can act action on. And again, here's the model. Again, this is from Mercy Corps. When information spreads, lives are saved, we can beat Ebola. Where's the actionable items? It wasn't there. Yeah, we could go to scale. We can take a small group of public health educators and reach Two million Liberians, I know how to do that. But if you don't have the appropriate messages to save lives, it's not going to work. And that's what happened. So again, many disasters, emergencies that I've worked in. We take satellite, these satellite uh, platforms, VSAT systems, satellite connectivity existed in West Africa. They're $10,000 to run for 12 months. They cost $3,000 each. They come in a backpack. I do a lot of orphanage work in Africa. And we link up orphanages through satellite technology and a 55-inch Samsung TV. And we put a big sign up, adults not allowed to intervene. And we just turn on the TV and connect these orphanages so they can talk to each other. We're trying to do that with hospitals and labs in West Africa, and no one would buy VSAT systems. Who's got a mobile phone? Yep. Anyone Skype? Video conferencing? Yep. So I FaceTime, Viber, Tango, Skype, VC, all these video conferencing platforms. We went to West Africa and said, what do you do with your, pho with your phone? We do Facebook, we do Twitter, we do Mixit, we do Tango, we do Viber. They do it all. Right. Do we do it in the hospital? No. So what we did, we got iPads and we bottled them to the wall so that we could have 24-7 video monitoring of the patients. I'm back in DC and on my phone, I am looking in the hospital. I am talking to the nurses every day through a platform. And how much money did it cost me? Zero dollars. I don't pay for Skype. OK. When you put on the, the, the personal protective, do, do we know who each other? Can we recognize each other? We went over there, and we had 10,000 people on the ground in personal protective equipment. We couldn't identify them. So every time we had a needle stick injury, every time we had an accident, it was a John Doe or a Jane Doe. We did a, a, an agreement with Road ID in the US, and I run with a running group, and we connect to a lot of other running groups. For $15, you buy one of these, and we sent one to West Africa for one of the nurses or one, or one of the staff, so they could start having some identification. How do you disinfect this? Drop it in bleach. And that wasn't happening. So we had so many of our healthcare workers unrecognized. Right, I want to just reiterate, it's not just the PPE. What did the World Health Organization, the CDC, do? They released documents, guidelines as PDF paper-based documents. Does that work? You guys are smarter than me at this. Does that work? No. So I, through the, we started drumming up work in, in, in states, within, in state health departments without the country, and we said, we're going to come to the state of Tennessee. Everyone's followed the CDC guidelines. Bring the PPE that you have interpreted was the right PPE. Here we have 65 hospitals came to our workshop. I had 34 different types of PPE. Where did you get your guidelines from? This document here, the CDC guidelines. How did 34, how did we get 34 different PPEs? Types of PPE. These ladies here are wearing pappas around their waist. They can't work. They can't put an IV line in. They can't look after a patient. They couldn't stay in those suits for five minutes, and the hospital administration had spent thousands of dollars investing in material that was never going to work. Again, very quickly, going back to Emory. We're in the US, remember? When you go into a hospital, don't bring your gun. Don't smoke. And by the way, if you've got Ebola, can you stop? I work with really smart people. 
At Emory University Hospital, who did I interview? The security guard. How many people read that? No one. So that was their triage system. We'd already had five patients at Emory, and this is the triage system that they thought was going to work. I went to so many other hospitals in the US, they'd all done the same thing. Okay, just quickly, no Ebola found in airport. There are three critical mission functions for screening for any infectious disease at an airport. Where have you been? Who did you have contact with? What's your temperature? And the third one, where are you going next? That question was not asked in the US. It was asked in Germany. It was asked in the UK. It was asked in Canada. When I evaluated the airport screening system in, in the US, they didn't ask that critical question. When you leave the airport, if you get sick, stay at home, call us, the 1-800-EBOLA help number that doesn't exist, and we'll come and pick you up. That was never told. My daughter, six, she's in sixth grade, and she said to me the other day, Dad, it was a Tuesday, what does the calendar say after Tuesday? WTF. She's rolling around the floor laughing her head off, thinking that's the funniest thing. I had a similar thought when I got a phone call from WHO, could you help us with this? In India, when you survive Ebola, you get a certificate from the World Health Organization. An Ebola survivor had arrived at the New Delhi airport and said, I am free of Ebola. Someone at the airport at immigration said, I want a semen sample. Who made that decision and why? And he went, what? And he gave them a semen sample. And it took hours. And it came back because we know that in Ebola survivors, we can still find, even if you have no, you're cured, you'll still find a Ebola in your tear ducts, mammary glands, in your milk, and in your semen. And we've now just had a, a publication this week where they found 175 days out Ebola in, a, in, in semen that was sexually transmitted. Where's our condom campaign? Who does condoms here? Anyone? Right, we, we're not doing that. Anyway, so Ebola in semen. So what did CDC release in a press conference on Sunday night in the US? Abstinence and no sex until further notice. <laughs> That's where we are, guys. Okay, second last slide. Who publishes here? In peer-reviewed journals, yeah? I work in academia. I am so lucky that I work at Penn State and Harvard Medical School that I, I got out of the you've got to publish or perish stuff. I don't do that. I just come here and talk and give really cool, you know, go to great conferences and meet wonderful people. A publication was published by the CDC in their Emerging Infectious Journal in July 2014. I know Randall Shop and Cynthia Rossi very well. They, they work in a lab, in a government lab about an hour from where I live. They looked at the October 2006, October 2008 samples from Liberia and Sierra Leone and in the Sierra Leone samples, and remember, Sierra Leone is hyper-endemic for a, a disease called Lassa fever. But we've never had the diagnostic capability to diagnose Lassa fever. So we just assumed everyone had Lassa fever. But look what they found. 8.6 and 8.2% of the samples from October 2006 to 2008 had Ebola. So the message I want you to take away today is Ebola has been endemic in West Africa for many years. We never had the diagnostic resources to look for it. And Yvonne was saying the other day, there's even papers now that go back to the 80s where we think we may have had Ebola. It's not about the bats, guys. It's not about the plums. It's about our lack of capability on the ground. Anyone heard of the post-Ebola syndrome? Nancy Whitball, one of our patients at Emory University Hospital that I actually saw, she wears a wig now. Her hair never grew back. Patient number three, Philip, was a triathlete. He has so much muscular pain, he can hardly walk. Anyone heard about that? No. Patient number one, Kent Brantley, has unilateral orchitis, extreme fatigue. Anyone heard about that? As Gail said, we have 15,000 survivors from Ebola in West Africa. What are we doing for them? This is real. We've never just, we've never had the numbers to really investigate. There's so much we don't know about this one disease, but we're not addressing their needs. Oops. Last slide. When you go to a country, what do we do? We support the people. We support their plan. The Nigerians had a plan. Why was I on the 7 p.m. news in Nigeria? Because this day, I got called to a church 
And I've thought, being in the US, I've seen big churches. I went to Nigeria and I've seen even bigger churches. This church had a thousand people. Out the front was a gentleman who had died from Ebola. The church leaders said, we're all going to line up and we're going to lay our hands on that patient. That's what they do. CDC came down, and I worked at CDC, and I have a lot of good friends at CDC. CDC came down and said, oh, no, you're not. And I said, yes, they are. CDC told me to come out into the car park, and I thought we were going to duke it out there and then, to have this conversation. What did we do next? We brought in the nurses that I trained. We brought in the gloves and the bleach and the disinfectant and the red biohazard bags, and we lined everyone up in that church, and they all laid hands with gloves on, and then we disinfected them. What happened the next day? The church leaders came to me and said, how can we help Gavin? I now have this massive church community, the Nigerian government has it, who are now saying, what's our role? Here's the three messages I want you to say every time you stand up on that pulpit. So again, we know this. It doesn't happen all the time. But when we go to countries, support their plan. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gavin. Next up, we have Yvonne McPherson. She's director of BBC Media Action USA, which is formerly known as the BBC World Service Trust USA. Yvonne represents BBC Media Action in the US and most recently led the development of the popular radio drama for Ebola prevention in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Prior to this, Yvonne was country director of the BBC World Service Trust in India. In this role, she was responsible for all strategic program, financial, and technical aspects of the trust operations. Yvonne has designed and managed behavior change initiatives on HIV AIDS, maternal and child health, gender equality, and livelihoods, among other issues. These programs are locally produced using radio, television, online, and mobile phones combined with community outreach to provide vital information to people in need. Prior to joining the BBC, she managed health projects in Africa and Asia for NGOs and UN agencies and was a healthcare business analyst in London. She holds a Master of Science from the London School of Economics and a BA from McGill University and has completed many short courses, including one on health and human rights at Harvard School of Public Health. Yvonne was nominated for the Jonathan Mann Award for Global Health and Human Rights in 2008 and was selected as an Asia Society Young Leader in 2011. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Gail. OK, so today I'm going to focus my remarks on at least three of the P's in social marketing. I'm going to look at product, which in our case is social and behavior change communication outputs. And I'm going to talk a bit about place and promotion, looking at the appropriate platforms and channels for Ebola communication. And here I'll spend a bit of time talking about the BBC's use of WhatsApp as a global first in a health crisis. Um, as as uh, Gail mentioned, I work for BBC Media Action, which is the international charity of the BBC created to use media for development. And in the context of Ebola, we were tasked with creating mass media output to prevent the spread of Ebola in the three most affected countries of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. I'd like to start with some background on the context, Sorry, that'll, um, which highlights the evolution of the key communication messages. In the early days of the health crisis, um, we saw this plastered absolutely everywhere. These messages that were, Ebola is real and stop Ebola. And in many ways, this was appropriate for its time because this concept of, of advertising that Ebola is real was addressing a very real problem at the time, which is that a lot of people doubted its existence and preferred to believe that Ebola was actually a government or a Western plot. Although it's an appropriate message, it also, from a marketing perspective, and all of you will recognize this, um, can see that it's highly problematic, too, because it's not actionable. The only actionable message around that time was on the promotion of hand washing. A few months into the crisis, expert 
experts agreed that we had to promote two main messages if we're going to prevent the spread of Ebola. One is seeking early treatment for symptoms and conducting safe burial practices. Again, these are appropriate messages, but also problematic. As Gail had pointed out, much of the communication at that time focused on what not to do. People were asked to don't come into contact with sick people's bodily fluids. Don't wash bodies of your deceased loved ones. And it's difficult to see what action you could take unless you're currently facing that situation. What are you going to do? And never mind that these don't messages fail to take into consideration the basic human norms around caring for loved ones. So we tasked ourselves with thinking of a relevant yet disruptive idea in, frankly, what was very an, a very noisy media environment. There was a lot of local media. We had artists who were creating songs. We had celebrity featured public service advertisements. There was a lot happening in the space. And we felt we needed to, whatever we were going to do, needed to add value and needed to communicate something else. We were also producing a weekly radio program where in the local languages in the region where we featured guests that were health officials, religious leaders, and ordinary people affected by Ebola. And we wanted our new product to be distinct from all the other communication that was out there. And we wanted something that was practical, actionable, and had an easily doable message for the general public. The insight into our creative idea was that Ebola creates an emergency-like situation for communities at high risk. In the event of an emergency, what are we all told to do? Any guesses? Call someone. Call someone, OK. Whether we're airline passengers or we live in an earthquake fault line, we're told to be prepared, right? Um, to be aware of what we can do should something go wrong, to have a plan, an emergency plan. And we also leaned on our experience in maternal and newborn health promotion, where we ask pregnant women to have an emergency birth plan, which means have emergency contact numbers close by, um, have a, a plan for your how you're going to get to the hospital, um, how to keep um, resources aside for this. Um, so we felt that families needed to do the same in the context of Ebola. Because having an emergency plan helps people deal with difficult decisions that have to be made in the heat of the moment and decisions that are often made in the presence of fear and panic. And the reward in making a plan is it gives people back a sense of control during this period of sheer helplessness and fear. And we wanted to encourage our audiences to have an emergency plan for what happens when a loved one um, shows some symptoms or what happens when they die. And this is a behavior that everyone can do and everyone can do right now. It would also require families to have really difficult conversations about taboo topics. Um, you don't talk about death in, in these cultures, and you certainly don't talk about your own death or the death of your loved ones. And so we acknowledge that this was going to be a really difficult thing to do. Um, also, these, these burial practices that have been around for so long, again, what we found from the limited research that we were getting on behavior was that people who knew that there was a risk in washing the bodies of their loved ones would still do it because the risk of not doing it, um, they felt sort of outweighed the, um, the Ebola risk. And those risks were things like um, they didn't want to send their loved one off to the afterlife without that proper ritual. Um, there'd be consequences for your loved one and their, their peace in the afterlife. Um, it could also bring the family bad luck and um, your, your loved ones could come back to haunt you. So these are really powerful um, um, consequences and things that we needed to address head on. So having a plan, we hoped, would encourage families to discuss their options, air their concerns, and feel more prepared and more in control in these really scary and uncertain times. Now, in the West Africa region, using TV was out of the question because TV ownership is very low. Um, this is not the case for radio, and therefore we decided to use radio as our mass platform. 
And we also decided to use the power of drama because drama can portray conflicts and challenges people face um, when faced with Ebola. And we felt that that would be an effective way to address this. So, this was the genesis of the character Mr. Plan Plan. Uh, Mr. Plan Plan is an itinerant trader. He's a wise fool. He champions having a plan. And he presents stories of what he sees around him. He travels from village to village. And he shows families torn apart over um, when someone falls sick. He shows friends misunderstanding each other, relationships being threatened, emotions boiling over, communities fighting to hold on to their traditions and rituals. Uh, the title of the radio drama is called Mr. Plan Plan and the People, and this is it in Liberian English. And we created two series of this radio drama of six episodes each, and to show how planning will help navigate you through Ebola. And I'm just going to show a very quick clip, if um, Rick can get that ready, um, which shows a bit of how we produce the drama and some of the actors in the process. Rick? We decided to develop a drama for Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Mr. Plan Plan and the people, where every episode mimics making those difficult decisions about a person they love who might be infected with the Ebola virus. BBC Media Action creative directors, script writers, and actors from all over the world recounted their personal stories and their desire to help their communities. Is it all Not mad. Oh la la. <laughs> you want to beat Ebola? My people, when you play, you can. Listeners are tuning in every day because they want to know what happens, calling in with their stories, which are very similar to what they're hearing in the drama. So it's clearly r resonating on an emotional level with people, which is exactly what we hoped would happen. Mr. Plan Plan, coming to your radio station. Okay, and here's a clip of one of the first episodes of the radio drama. So remember, it's a radio drama, so I've just put the photographs here, um, but it is a radio drama, and I'm gonna play you a clip, and it is in Liberian English, but actually it's very easy to understand what's going on. So if you could play that clip, please. What? My son not got Ebola. They say as soon as someone gets sick, call 4455. Over my dead so you want everyone to die in this house? You want everybody to die? You know what can happen to people when they take them to that place? That's the end. I'm calling 4455 now. I can't believe what you're doing to your family. I can tell you what I'm doing with safe, my father. Look at how they're fighting. Who making sense? The man who don't want the son to go or the father who want to stick to the plan? So each episode shows a dilemma, and normally there's one person who wants to do what would normally be right, and someone else who's advocating for the correct behavior. And a refrain in our drama was, what's wrong is right, and what's right is wrong. Because a lot of people describe Ebola as um, everything just got turned on its head. You know, Everything that you believed you should do when someone dies, you weren't allowed to do. And so you had to do the opposite. So we really kind of adopted that language and that concept. And looking at um, this issue of safe burial practices, in that episode, we selected, um, it, we, it was the chief's son who died. And, um, and it was the chief who had to take the bold decision not to perform the burial rituals, despite enormous traditional pressures to do so. And so this helped us have this authority figure that became a model for positive deviance. And uh, we were asking people to take a pledge so that um, to say that if something happens to me, um, I'm okay if you don't perform these burial practices on me. And in the episode, the chief takes the pledge as well. Okay, so Mr. Plan Plan and the People was first produced in three languages for the three countries, and it was aired on our network of over 90 partner radio stations in the region over the Christmas and the New Year's period. 
And that's particularly salient because in Sierra Leone, for example, the government canceled all holiday celebrations during that period, and they didn't allow any public gatherings. And normally Christmas and New Year's, just like everywhere else, um, people would be out enjoying themselves. And so that meant that people were in their homes, and they were relying on their radios as the primary source of um, information on the outside world, but also entertainment. And so this allowed us to have massive audience, and a lot of people um, then were able, we were able to reach people during this period. And it's since been translated into another six regional languages because of its success and popularity. And looking at any good um, behavior change initiative, we took a multimedia and multi-channel approach. So we didn't just use radio. The Mr. Plan Plan drama was uploaded onto the mobile phones of over 1,000 community social mobilizers to activate and to augment the mass media output and to stimulate community discussions and action. And unfortunately, I won't be able to go into detail on that because I would like to focus the second half of my presentation looking at uh, social media because um, I think most of you will be familiar with community mobilization activities. Um, so just before I get to the social media piece, um, I should say a bit about the impact that Mr. Plan Plan has and the research that we have available. Now, getting re robust data in a health crisis is certainly a challenge. Uh, for example, there wasn't a lot of freedom of movement um, during the crisis, and therefore our regular methods of random household representative surveys um, weren't an option for us. So instead, we used a less randomized um, approach, which was uh, mobile phone polls. And uh, again, so not ideal, but um, this is what we had. And the poll showed that in, uh, where we did it in Liberia, that more than half of those that had listened to the drama had been motivated to make a plan for their family. And we also did fo fo uh, focus groups and showed that participants said that Mr. Plan Plan improved their understanding of what actions they could take to prepare their family. Um, also, one day, our Freetown office got a call from the office of the president of Sierra Leone requesting copies of Mr. Plan Plan so that he could share them with um, the other government departments and partners. So apparently, the, plan, the president is a, is a fan of Mr. Plan Plan. Uh, but for me, even more compelling was the feedback we got from our radio partners and station managers all uh, across the, the region. Uh, in addition to their feedback where they said that the drama does portray very realistic scenes of the difficult life decisions, we were most pleased to hear that the message of having a plan really came through quite strongly and that people were taking, an act were taking action to make a plan. And here are some examples of quotes. And we heard all the time that Mr. Plan Plan was the talk of the town, that it's become a slogan, and that even children sing the Mr. Plan Plan jingle. And people ask each other, hey, man, do you have a plan? Um, so we were quite pleased to see that that main message really came through strongly. And these are just three quotes, um, and we have dozens more. The second topic that I want to talk about is around promotion. And we, of course, needed to select an appropriate communication platform for this content. And I'd already mentioned that radio was the medium that, or is the medium that is, has incomparable reach throughout the region. So that was an appropriate um, uh, main uh, mass media platform. And due to the strength of the BBC brand and also our radio partner network, um, as well as the quality of the programming, in Liberia alone, uh, our program was aired about 90 times a week on 22 radio stations. And um, no other program was heard more often and um, so widely. Uh, similarly, in Sierra Leone, we have 41 regional and community radio stations in Guinea, 23, so great coverage. But what I'd like to spend some time on um, for the, my last sort of five minutes up here is talking about what I get asked a lot about, which is our digital strategy, and particularly the use of the chat app, WhatsApp. So can I get a show of hands of how many of you use WhatsApp? Okay, fantastic. Um, so for those of you who don't know what WhatsApp is, it's an instant messaging app for smartphones that operates under a subscription business model. And it uses the internet to send text, images, audio, and visual messages. And it's the most popular app globally. It has 700 million active users, 
and it's also the most popular chat app in Africa. At the height of the Ebola crisis, the news division of the BBC launched an Ebola WhatsApp information service aimed at users in West Africa. And the service provides, and as you can see here, um, audio, this is, this is the, what an audio would look like, um, audio messages as well as um, images and also text messages to the subscribers. And, and these messages came largely from partners at WHO and UNICEF. So how does it work? You push content out by creating a WhatsApp group where users sign up and add the service to their contacts. Now, for those of you who know WhatsApp, um, there is a problem with this, which is that a group size is maximum right now only 150 people. That's what WhatsApp allows. And not only that, but you can see everyone in the group and you can see everyone's replies. So this is highly problematic for the BBC and they didn't want that for obvious reasons. They wouldn't be able to control it. Um, so there is an alternative. You can create what's called a broadcast group and it's similar to an email uh, blind copy list. And again, you can push content out and the subscribers will receive it. And they can even reply to the broadcaster, but not to everyone. And you can't see who else has signed up. Again, for WhatsApp, um, they've limited the broadcast group to 250 people. WhatsApp really wasn't created to push out content to large numbers of people. However, WhatsApp lifted the limit for the BBC because we were the first news organization to use WhatsApp for this purpose, and they were interested to see how this was going to work. The service is still running and has more than 20,000 subscribers. Most of these subscribers are in West Africa. And we can tell this from the phone numbers of the people who have subscribed. And the biggest subscriber group is in Sierra Leone, followed by Nigeria and Ghana. And interestingly, as the health crisis is waning, the subscriber numbers continue to climb. Um, and I'm not really sure why that's the case. And there's also very low unsubscribe rates. And so feedback has been really positive. Now, the most important thing is that WhatsApp is primarily an interactive platform. So the BBC was very aware that it had to carefully monitor the messages it got back from subscribers and follow them and respond to their questions as needed. And we did get a lot of questions. Most of them were around uh, very basic things like the roots of transmission. Um, and we would often um, respond en masse when, when the questions were common. And, um, but I think more importantly, we received messages that gave us real insights into what it was like to live in the crisis and the difficulties that people faced and the questions that people had. And the BBC News Division would then get tip-offs on stories that it would later cover in the main news outlets. And so it, found, it was a great source of getting personal stories and that would enhance the coverage on, on, the, on the rest of the, um, on the rest of the, the news outlets. Um, but that's BBC News Division. Um, here at BBC Media Action, we focus on behavior change, um, not news gathering. And um, we also then tapped into WhatsApp uh, to create um, uh, localized content, because the BBC stuff is still quite high level. It's in English and it's in French for Guinea, um, and it's a recreation of, of UNICEF and WHO content. Um, so we now have our own service, which is much more localized. And our primary social media objective for this project, um, both for our Facebook page um, and our own uh, WhatsApp service was to have a forum for two-way conversation and allowing people to feel comfortable asking us questions and sharing stories and expressing concerns. And we also aim to produce shareable content that informs users and humanizes the situation, emphasizing actionable changes and an, in a positive can-do attitude and tone. And, um, and we monitor the page for this. But we do acknowledge that obviously um, internet connection in the region is not great. And, um, and therefore, those that are using the, the, the WhatsApp service and are um, using our website, which has about 10,000 fans, the Facebook page, um, uh, you know, represent a younger and, and wealthier part of the population. 
Um, so I'll just finish by just um, sharing some quick kind of pros and cons and learnings in reference to using social media and WhatsApp in particular for the Ebola response. On the positive side, I'd already mentioned this, but um, the greatest asset is that it's interactive. Um, radio is too, and we have our radio call-in shows, um, and uh, so it's another way of interacting with audiences. But it's also really easy for people to interact with us, and what's great about WhatsApp is they can send us audio messages and video messages, not just text messages. So it's a super easy broadcast platform to get feedback as well if you are an active WhatsApp user. And it's very easy for users to use. Um, in, in, in this part of the world, chat apps are used much more than Facebook, much more than Twitter. And uh, for many of them, it's um, cheaper or a free alternative to text messaging. And, um, and we've been told things like you know, Twitter on phones and Facebook, so you still have to sign in with your passwords and it could be a little bit cumbersome, whereas your WhatsApp, you just go in, you record a message and you press send. And for some, chat apps are the first experience with social media. Um, another learning is that short audio clips work really effectively. We're looking at 30 to 45 second audio clips. And this is great for people who have low levels of literacy, which is also relevant for the three countries, and where you can be a little bit more creative too, and you can send bits of the drama, since we've already recorded them on radio. And, um, and, then, but we, and we didn't use video, because again, that requires more bandwidth and um, you know, uh, higher level of uh, smartphones. And we just had our, our target body audience in mind. And the, the last um, thing on the positive side is that social media is really effective at getting engagement from leaders. And we found this across our projects, um, actually, in Africa and in Asia, that leaders are more easily reachable and responsive on social media than through more regular channels. Um, so if you do want to get a response from someone, if you send them a message through social media, you're, you're going to get a better response than just bringing up their office. On the downside with WhatsApp, it's very labor intensive. Um, so when, when the BBC developed this, there isn't a desktop version. So you're actually managing the entire thing on one handset. Um, that means manually loading every single subscriber to a list and, and actually creating the content on the handset itself. And, and it all has to be from one handset. And so that doesn't make working collaborati collaboratively very uh, easy. And I've been told that I think WhatsApp has just come out with a desktop version, um, but I'm not sure how, how that's working in its, its first iteration. And finally, there's risk. And, and the project manager at BBC News that manages this said he was absolutely paranoid that he would lose the phone. Um, when you lose the phone, you lose the project. Um, so there's, you know, that, that's a bit scary when you're managing a 20,000 subscriber you know, broadcast list. Um, so those are just a few learnings on WhatsApp and, and social media. Uh, the last thing, just as I wrap up, is just the, what's next for us and coming back to Mr. Plan Plan. And um, the benefits of the creator and the, the, the creative idea is um, to use an advertising term, um, Mr. Plan Plan is a stretchable idea. Um, we can stretch the concept of making a plan and the character, Mr. Plan Plan, beyond Ebola. And we think this is gonna be quite effective in the recovery stage. And so if you think about it, as the, as the region moves into recovery mode, we can continue to champion the concept of having a household plan in reference to emerging priorities like vaccination or rebuilding livelihoods. Uh, so we haven't seen the last of Mr. Plan Plan, because when you plan, you can. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. So our next presenter is um, Neely Hicks, who, um, as I said, recorded her presentation from the US. And in the interest of time, I think we'll just play you a portion of it, because I know I'm always frustrated when there's no time left at the end for questions. And we really want to um, save some time for that. Um, so Neely Hicks is the director of ICT4D Church Initiatives at the United Methodist Communications. And for those of you who don't know that acronym, ICT4D stands for Information, Communications, and Technology for Development. 
Where technology and social good meet, you will find Neely Hicks leading historic efforts in the United Methodist Church to apply ICTs for enhanced education, health, and job skills development in low resource parts of the world. As director of ICT for Ch Church Initiatives at United Methodist Communications, the global communications agency of the United Methodist Church, Neely manages a portfolio that spans nine African countries, the Philippines, and other parts of the developing world. Her passion to build appropriate, affordable, and accessible solutions for emerging nations has led to speaking engagements at the United Nations Info Poverty World Conference in Geneva, Switzerland, and New York, as well as teaching opportunities in Africa, Haiti, and the Philippines. An ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church, Neely holds a Master of Divinity from Vanderbilt University and a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Belhaven College. As you can imagine, the faith-based community has played a really important role in the Ebola response in these three countries. So we thought it would be great to hear from somebody like Neely about what that sector has been doing. So Rick, if we could tee up the video. Good afternoon. I'm Neely Hicks. I'm the director of ICT for D Church Initiatives at United Methodist Communications. We're the global communications agency of the United Methodist Church. I'm here to share with you about our communications response to the Ebola crisis. Um, you'll see throughout this presentation that I'm willing to share our mistakes, our failures, as well as our successes, um, because I think that probably all of you know that in order to get to success, you go through quite a few mistakes. Um, but I think our heart was in the right place in trying to respond to the critical needs of people suffering um, in West Africa. And so I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'll join with you on Skype in just a few minutes as well. So I'm gonna tell you something. When you're trying to implement some new technology in a time that is a critical time, it's just not a really good mix. We were in Nashville trying to make a difference in Liberia and Sierra Leone, where our church networks were, and we were trying to do things that were new that we had not really done before. So um, the, the first thing that we did was, um, you know, I thought, okay, we can use text messaging. Text messaging is something that the people on the ground have access to via their mobile phones. So um, I went to the, our treasure trove of ICT for D tools and pulled out Frontline SMS. And Frontline SMS is just, it's been a staple as one of the technologies that UMCOM has recommended to the church worldwide because you could use it without having to have the internet. So somebody on the ground could have one computer, tie their mobile phone to it, and then be able to send out group text messages via that one computer to their local community. So I thought, okay, this is gonna be easy. I've worked before with different people abroad and I've taught them how to use Frontline SMS. I'll just get them on Skype and I'll teach them how to use this tool. And so the first conversation that I had with a pastor in Liberia was now looking back on it kind of comical because there I was telling him about this new tool that he had never heard of and I was t trying to explain to him how he could use it and implement it there and I think it was um, just a, a very interesting response that I got. He said, um, but the pastors don't have internet and I said, but they don't need the internet. And he said, but they don't have computers. And I said, you only need one computer. Um, you know, it was just kind of this back and forth until um, I thought, okay, so I'm just not explaining this well. So I need to have somebody else come in and explain in a way that they would understand better. And so I got the best people, um, Laura Walker McDonald um, and Valerie Oliphant from uh, SimLab to help and we still weren't getting the success that we needed and I got a communicator um, Priscilla Muzaringwa from Zimbabwe to um, 
to get online with our communicator there in Sierra Leone and try to explain to him how to use this tool. And Phileas was just he, he was so overloaded with the other things that were going on in the crisis that learning a new communications tool was the least of his worries. So we got the bright idea to simply collect mobile numbers from people and to get the pastor's mobile numbers from Liberia and Sierra Leone and then send the messages via Frontline Cloud from Nashville, Tennessee. So this was actually a turning point um, because we realized that the value of a mobile number is equal to the value of email and for you social marketers you know that the value of an email address is immense. People um, are reached by your messages and um, we thought we can do a similar thing with SMS. So we started our program collecting mobile numbers of pastors that we know in Liberia and Sierra Leone and then we started looking for messages. Well the SMS library on Ebola had not yet been created by the CDAC network. Um, they've got a lot of mobile messages out there um, on malaria, on um, HIV AIDS, on cholera, um, dysentery, all of these different things but there was nothing available on Ebola. So we had to once again go back to the drawing board and um, we took the WHO and CDC materials and our great editing staff at UMCOM um, parsed those messages down into 160 characters or less and then we put the bishops, um, the appropriate bishop's name on each text message. You know, at first I was resistant to that because I thought this is going to be um, taking up priceless characters um, in a 160 character message. But the value of actually having a person's name that the pastors knew on each text message proved to make the message actually more trustworthy than we ever would have thought um, had it not been for local people just simply telling us we've got to have the bishop's name on these messages. So um, first lesson learned was work with the local um, people there on the ground, design with the user. Um, and then secondly, to make sure that you're working with the existing ecosystem of um, telecommunications. So um, I think that that part of the work actually turned out quite well. Um, we learned that failing fast and failing often is really easy to do in a time of crisis. Um, reiterating based on the feedback that we were getting from people um, made the project actually gain some success in that we were able to persevere and make those text messages come alive to the people who really felt isolated. So I'd like for Gail to show you something. Gail, can you get out that uh, free play energy assist radio? I'd love for you to hold it up and show it to people now since my hands are not there to do it myself. That free play energy assist radio is a really cool device. Um, it is something that provides communication to people who are living in areas where batteries are not available or not affordable and where it's difficult to charge your cell phone um, because of lack of electricity. So it's got a hand crank radio and it's got a solar cell phone charger and it's got a solar lantern. So it's really great in a humanitarian crisis. So this was another great idea that we got um, through a friend of ours, um, Laura. She said, um, have you seen these radios? This would be good to supply to the pastors because we knew that during the Ebola crisis, people were limited in their means of uh, roaming about and having public gatherings. So the places where people were going to get their cell phones charged might not be operational. And if people's cell phones died, um, because they weren't charged, um, what good would our text messaging do? So we thought, well, we'll just ship them. 
And, you know, it seemed like from a distance that this was going to be something brilliant and something that would be fairly easy because, you know, we have online ordering. Um, we had great people working with us at Free Play Energy. Um, but, you know, it just proved difficult. And this was one of the things that I think we often fail to do is look more closely at the ecosystem there of um, wherever you're working, of how you're going to get uh, devices into a given country. Um, okay, you know, Rick, can we stop the video there? And the church will receive them. The church will distribute them. So I'm sorry that we don't have time to hear the rest of Neely's story. She has some great. Um, uh, lessons to share about her whole experience trying to equip her pastor network with Ebola technology and messages. Um, I know that we've run right up to the end of this time and there's another session coming, but we really do want to answer any questions that you have and our speakers have graciously offered to either, you know, step out to the hallway or another room or just in the back of this room, um, spend the time that, that they need to answer your questions. So thank you very much for coming today.